Welcome to our eighth lesson of the Cornerstone Connections. Glad that you could join us. Our panelists for today are Brenda, Steve, Gideon, and our teacher, teacher Kev Kevin. And um, on instruments, we have Amy on the violin and Sid as a pianist. And we have Joyce as at the sign language. I am Valerie Precious. I'll be taking you through the mission. Before we start, let us bow for a word of prayer. Oh God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for being with us this far. Thank you for guiding us and protecting us. Now we're about to start. Please be with us. May your spirit guide us. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. So the title of our mission today is Loving a Neighbor. The old woman called out to seven-year-old Elliot in the African country of Ghana. I see that you don't go to church, she said. Come to church with me. Elliot looked at the next door neighbor, whom he called auntie. It was true, he didn't go to church, but he liked the idea. He and his family had moved into the neighborhood just a few weeks earlier, and he didn't have friends. Moreover, he was curious to know about God. Thank you for inviting me, he said. Let me ask mother for permission. That's a good idea, auntie said. When she gives permission, be ready to go early on Saturday morning and put on your best clothes. We are going to worship God. Elliot ran home to ask mother for permission. She gave it. On Saturday morning, Elliot woke up excited about going to church. Then he remembered that auntie had cautioned him not to be late. He quickly got dressed in his best clothes and ran next door. I'm ready to go, he said as soon as auntie opened the door. Happy Sabbath, auntie said. She looked at the boy carefully. Have you eaten breakfast? She asked. Elliot shook his head. He had left home before mother had finished preparing breakfast. Would you like to eat? Auntie said. Elliot nodded his head. Good, Auntie said. You need to eat. She served rice with tomato stew. It was delicious. After eating, Elliot got into a car with Auntie and her family and they went to church. Elliot didn't know anyone in Sabbath school, and he felt terribly shy. He sat all by himself, but that didn't bother him. He was amazed to hear for the first time about Noah and the ark. He understood that it is important to obey God. Noah obeyed God and got into the ark. Noah's family obeyed God and got into the ark. Even the animals obeyed God and got into the ark. But nobody else obeyed God, and they all died in the flood. Elliot decided to obey God always. At home, Elliot told mother about Noah. That's a good story, mother said. You should be like Noah and obey God. Elliot smiled. He had already promised himself that he would obey God always. I liked going to church with auntie, he said. I want to go every Saturday. The next Sabbath, he went to church with auntie again, but this time he didn't feel quite so shy. Some of the children even spoke to him, and he made new friends. He especially enjoyed the Bible story, and back home, told mother again about what he had learned. As time passed, mother began to look forward to hearing the stories that Elliot brought home from church. A desire grew in her to hear even more Bible stories. So one Sabbath, she went to church with Elliot. Elliot was so happy. More time passed, and Elliot's older brother and sister also started going to church with auntie, Elliot, and mother. And so it happened that the family who never went to church now goes to church every Sabbath. Elliot is now 12 years old, and he is so happy that auntie invited him to church when he was only seven. If other Adventists would love their neighbors like auntie loved me, they would be able to gain many people for Christ, he said. If we treat people with love, we can easily win hearts for Christ. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help a nursing school in Elliot's homeland of Ghana. The nursing school teaches students about Jesus and how to help the sick. Thank you for planning a generous offering next month.
Thank you for that beautiful item. I'd like to welcome you all to lesson number eight. It's titled Running. Well, um, soul is still our subject matter, guys. And um, in this particular one, we are going to highlight one of his chiefest failures. And uh, <clears throat> this, his chiefest failure was actually jealousy. Okay. And uh, there was also another beautiful element in this, in this story, uh, which we will highlight much, much, much later. But first, we'll start with um, his chiefest failure. Then next, we look at one of the best lessons that we can actually learn from, from the story of, of Saul and his fall. So I'd like to introduce a panelist from my left. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve, and I'm happy to be here with you today. Hi, I'm Brenda Maiwa, and I will be part of this mission reading, t uh, mission <laughs> lesson today. Sorry. Thank you, Gideon. Um, Gideon, and it's nice to study the word with you today. Okay. So welcome all. Um, I'd like to straight on to just go into the what do you think section, and I'd like Gideon to take us through of what he actually thinks over the statement that is there when. So in the what do you think section, we have a question here asking us why we dislike jealous people. Mm -hmm. In my words, I'd say I dislike jealous people because more often than not, you find that they are also capable of doing something, but they're just lying on their abilities and they are making you look like you're bad for mm -hmm. doing whatever you can do. Mm -hmm. it, you might find that it's something that's, that's just natural to you, mm -hmm. and they can do it too if they tried, but they're not trying anything. And, mm -hmm. they, and they might even go to some extent to make you stop doing something. Mm -hmm. I was actually just thinking about it. For you to answer this question, you must at least disqualify yourself as being jealous. Um, are we... Is there a point in time whereby we can actually say we are jealous of something? Personally, yes. now, Steve, have you ever been jealous? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I could say yes. Mm -hmm. but it was when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And at that, that, that time, I had not really understood the value of, let's say, gratitude. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I was jealous of a few things, just like a toy or something. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really that. That big. That big, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, okay. Brenda, have you ever been jealous? Um, personally, yeah, I think so. Like, um, it's it's something that I feel is is okay. Not not in the best way, but it is um, in, inevitable in like people's lives. Like in every stage mm -hmm. in your life, you would be jealous of something. When you're younger, you're jealous of a toy. You move up, and let's say when you early teen stages mm -hmm. and peer pressure is really heavy and you're jealous of what other kids have and what you don't have. Mm. So in each stage, I think there's just a certain thing that someone wants and you don't have and that mm -hmm. causes jealousy, mm -hmm. even sometimes what the person knowing. So I feel like growing up, mm -hmm. I might have been jealous of things and I didn't even know I was jealous of them mm -hmm. until like you think back on it and you're like, I was th that was actually jealousy or envy mm -hmm. that was happening there. So okay. yeah, I think so. Thank you. Gideon, what is it that you think made Saul to be so jealous and angry of David? Mm, just to look into the story, sorry to invade into mm -hmm. that, but uh, Saul was, David was getting so much praise and glory mm -hmm. for what he was doing, mm -hmm. more than Saul, but when you think about it, mm -hmm. it was Saul's job to be doing this, and many people didn't have it in mind, mm -hmm. it was also David's job. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing something that is 
without it, that is outside your parameters, outside mm. what you should be doing, it gets so much praise because you look like the hero. Mm. But when, let's use a practical example, if you go out there and save someone from robbers or something, mm. that gets so much attention, it gets mm. so much praise that, oh, look at this person, he's a hero, and whatever. But if a police does that, it's their job. Mm. So if, if for Sol here, he was doing his work mm. and he wasn't getting as much praise. But David, for doing something that, that seemed very minor to Sol, mm. he got so much praise from it. And that's what made Sol jealous. So the other question I'll ask, is there anything that David did that actually made Saul to be jealous? What do you guys think? Mm. Is there something David did that, of course Gideon has already mentioned it, but would it been, have been better if he didn't do it? Um, for me, the way I see it, David didn't really do anything to um, gain the, the negative emotions Saul felt towards him. Mm. I feel like David was just, like David had always been like this and you can, if you go back deeper into the Bible, I mean the beginning of David's stories, his brothers didn't have the best um, mm. attitude towards him and that is because number one, he was the last born mm. and also he was, it kind of reminds me of Joseph, mm. he was one of the best of, of the group that was there and for Saul, the fact that um, David was so amazing at what he did, like later on when we go into the story, Saul would send him for missions and he, everything he would do, he, he'd come back victorious. Mm. And I feel like that's, that really triggered Saul because he was like, in rhetorical questions, like why? Why is he so amazing? And I felt like it just bothered him because he is the king. Mm. He should... He should be the best. He should be praised more than everyone mm. else because mm. he's in that high position. And the fact that someone below him, someone he gave power to, was getting all that glory mm. instead of him, mm. um, it really, really uh, triggered him in a way that I don't think, not in a, in a positive way, in a ne negative way. Mm. So even if David did not do anything, he mm. would still um, harbor those emotions because David was just being himself. There's nothing mm. he really did towards mm. Solomon. Uh, mm. so I, mean. mm. yeah. I think now that um, you've briefly illustrated what is happening in the story, now what do you deduce um, out of this story in regards to David, Jonathan, and Saul? That after reading First Samuel eighteen one to sixteen, mm. what actually do you get out of the story um, with the questions that are asked therein? Um. In the into the story part, it goes really deep in First Samuel chapter 18, 1 to 6. It goes really deep on where these emotions came from and how uh, Jonathan, Saul, and David were all linked together mm. towards the ending of the story. And it all started with when um, Jonathan and David became really close. And this was after uh, David had joined um, Saul's uh, group and he was now active in um, politics, let's say in the wars that were going on. He was very close to Saul when it comes to war politics. And Jonathan and David became very close friends and he says that they made a vow to each other. Mm. And some might even say it was, um, their love was one of a kind, one of the best loves shown in the Bible. And I feel like it's not talked about, but the fact that Saul's own son was loving someone that he hated so much even though he didn't know it, like a subconscious hate was growing. And the fact that his son was so close to this man, I felt that's where it really started and how it caused him to start looking for more things to hate him. Randomly in the story, you can see how David was playing his liar for him and Saul threw a spear on him mm. for no reason. Mm. And you can really, you can, it really pushes you to, uh, to ask why, why did Saul do that? And I feel like it was something that was growing. Mm. And it started with the love that Jonathan had for David mm. and it just kept on growing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right, all right. I mean, that's, uh, that's beautiful. Now, now having completed um, at least into the story, can you list at least two ways, two specific ways in which probably maybe Saul could have reacted as opposed to how he reacted in the actual story. What suggestions do you have to maybe a soul in these days 
who's dealing with jealousy, who feels like someone else is doing better than them to the point of hatred, what two suggestions do you give to such a person? Mm. Um, I, would like, I'm, I'm, I want to find a way to phrase it, but before I do that, uh, something I picked up on, especially the way Saul reacted when uh, his envy took over, Saul was the king of Israel. He was the, he was the person placed as a representative of God to the children of Israel. And if you think about it, it's the same thing that happens today and back in Israel when the children of Israel would not give God the glory he deserved. But instead of God getting angry and being envious of gods that could not speak or were made of clay and mud, he would either give the Israel's punishments and then forgive them, but he would always, he never put it upon them to destroy them. Yes, there are times he was like, I wish I could destroy these people, like why did they create them? But he always came back and said, but they are, my, they, are, they, are my, they are my children. I made them and I love them. And he would, at the end of the day, God would still be with the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. And now this is where I feel like Saul went wrong. He was supposed to be in the place of God. And instead of going to God to ask, because the first thing he should have done mm -hmm. was to go and pray. Because mm -hmm. if he felt all these emotions, he should have gone and gone down on his knees and prayed to God to give him the strength to deal with these emotions. Mm -hmm. But because the Spirit of God had left Saul, and this is seen later back in the story, the Spirit of God had left Saul. It was not the first thing he, he thought about. And mm. this can show that if you're not close to God, if you don't read the Bible, if you don't try and strengthen your relationship with God, mm. when these problems arise, your first thought won't be, I need to go ask God. I need to figure out a solution with God, not get a solution and then present it to God after I have done it. So mm. that's the first thing he should have done. He should have gone to ask God for help, and that is only by having a close relationship with God, which he did not have. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I think Saul should have done was uh, not listen to the praises, because mm -hmm. he was taking his own, like he was uh, estimating his power, or he was giving himself a rank, depending on what other people thought of him, and the comparison they were doing between David and uh, Saul. Mm -hmm. it's a, in the, into the story part, it talks about how when David came back from wars, mm -hmm. the women would come and they would shout uh, that Saul has slain thousands and David his ten thousands. So they were clearly making a comparison. And in a way, you can see this is the devil trying to poke mm -hmm. on Saul because he knows Saul is dealing with this issue. The devil watches and he knows what you're struggling with mm -hmm. and he will make situations to worsen those those emotions mm. and I felt like instead of Saul not listening to them because the only type of acknowledgement you should be looking for is mm. from God. Mm. That is the only acknowledgement you should look for mm. but Saul didn't do that. He was looking for the acknowledgement from the children of Israel, from the praises that people were giving mm. and that was one of the, that's the second part he went wrong. Instead of listening he should have just ignored the praises and looked for his acknowledgement in God. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, analysis. Now, um, we see that into the story that um, Saul was now in pursuit of David. And um, a huge coincidence happens here, Gideon. And uh, they find themselves in the same cave. Uh, Saul is over here resting, and is resting apparently where David was. What happens here, Gideon? That question again. Let me repeat the question. David is on the run. He's been pursued by Saul. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then Saul decides to rest. Apparently, where Saul rests in this cave, it is the same cave where David is. Um, I just want you to briefly illustrate, according to 1 Samuel 24, verse 10, what actually happens here. Because um, David finds himself in a situation whereby he finds Saul resting. Could have killed him, you know. But what actually transpired in that particular set? So David was given the, okay, he was, a perfect opportunity was availed to him. Mm -hmm. He had the chance to kill Saul and just mm -hmm. get the story over with. Mm -hmm. But um, what he chose to do, I think he cut his robe mm -hmm. and just to show Saul that 
hey, I, I had the chance. Mm. I could have come and cut your... Mm. Uh, sorry, mm. I came and cut your robe mm. and you didn't know it. Mm. So I could have also killed you mm. in your sleep. Mm. But David, as we... When, if I may read First uh, Samuel 24, 10, mm. it says, Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the un- Lord's anointed. Mm-hmm. So David refrained from killing Saul, mm-hmm. because as we have read here, he said that Saul was the Lord's anointed. Mm-hmm. To kill him was just not an option. Mm-hmm. Though it seemed uh, so easy, it was so so convenient for the time, mm-hmm. Uh David chose not to do it. Mm-hmm. Saul was God's chosen. So the reason was, Saul was God's anointed, and therefore, you ought not to touch God. the God's anointed. Now, how does that help us to deal with differences in the church setting, differences in, um, in amongst our peers? How does that principle help us to deal with other people uh, in, when conflict arises? That's an open question. Anyone can answer it. Steve, you want to go first? Okay. So one way I view, uh, one way we can deal with this really is everyone is unique in their own way. And we have to find a way to, we have to be grateful for what we have, our strengths, our capabilities. And we, use, we are supposed to use those in God's house to the best of our ability. So. <clears throat> when conflict arises, we're supposed to acknowledge the differences that we might have between each other, find out how best we can contribute to God's word, to the church in general. And I believe when we do that, we can solve conflicts better. It can be easier to mm. assign roles to people because you know what uh, you're good at. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Any other contribution on that? How can we deal with our fellow brethren, given how David dealt with so? Mm, I feel um, in the church, a church is not very different from what was uh, going on back in Israel, because they would go to the temple mm. during Sabbath, and they would uh, fellowship together. And of course, there had to be conflicts inside mm. um, the temple. Mm. And I feel the best way as the people within the church, the best way we can solve conflicts is by facing them as soon as they start. If we let them grow, it mm. becomes harder to deal with them. If you let a big tree grow, it'll, the harder it will fall. Mm. But if you start when it's small, it'll be able, you'll be able to uproot it easily and mm. deal with the problem. And I feel like that's a problem that hasn't, um, that's a solution that hasn't been taken up in many churches because mm-hmm. a problem starts and they keep quiet about it. And it grows, it grows, and more people get involved. And then mm. when it finally comes out, it's such a big thing that it's, people, like, people shy away from dealing with it because it's such a big problem and people don't like dealing with mountains. Mm. So I feel we should learn to deal with these conflicts when there's are still molehills or just a tiny bump on the ground, mm. then waiting for them to become huge mountains that we can't um, deal with. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, Steve, when you read the flashlight, you see, it tells you that David's blameless character aroused the wrath of the king. Um, you know, there's a, there's a text, I think, of prophecy that says that in the last days, we shall have people who, who despise those that are good. And, and in this one now, King Saul despised David because he was a good person. How do you explain that? How do you break that down? So, if we also read further into the flashlight, mm. yeah, you will notice, let me look for the excerpt, it says, yeah, he deemed that the very life and presence of David cast a reproach upon him, mm. since by contrast it presented his own character mm. to a disadvantage. Mm. So, this simply tells us Saul realized that he was in the wrong, that, that his uh, character was not, that did not match up to David, 
and he didn't know when that to, he didn't know when he to look that way to the Israelites. Mm. You see, and if I can give a similar example, it's that one of Jesus. Jesus was blameless. He didn't commit any sin on mm. earth. You see, and people started liking him. But you see, what that did is that it made the Pharisees hate him mm. because they were the ones who were supposed to be the standard. They were supposed to set the standard on morality. But when they saw when they saw that Christ was doing some was doing something better than them, even though they did not they did not know he was the Messiah, it kind of arced them. It's like when uh, some you find someone who does something better than you. Sometimes, mm. sometimes it makes you think like, why can't it be me mm. and not them? So that's where the envy comes in, mm. and that's where maybe hatred comes in for someone. Mm. So I think like when when someone lives um, a pretty much righteous life, it's a rebuke to to they that are not godly, and this makes the ungodly hate them. Now, well in, well in. So, Brenda, um, I can see several punchlines here. Um, which is your favorite, and why? What what does this um, list of scriptures mean in relation to this story? So we have around like six punchlines over here. Uh, John 13, 1, Matthew 16, 25, Proverbs 29, 23, Romans 12, 13, and uh, Matthew 11, 29, Exodus 33, and verse 14. And uh, personally, the one that really impacted me the most, uh, I had two, but I'll just read the one that really touched me the most, and that's um, Exodus 33, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And it says, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. So I feel this is the one that related the most with the story and what we were trying to find out in the story. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you really um, analyze the, the story, if you think about it, and just see what is the main theme, what is the most common thing throughout the whole story is the spirit of God mm -hmm. or the spirit of anger from God. Mm -hmm. And in this verse, it says that the Lord, the Lord says that my presence will be with you mm -hmm. and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. And we can see throughout the story, Saul is anxious. Mm -hmm. he's, um, he's not at peace. And this is because the Lord's spirit, his presence had left him. Mm -hmm. And because of that, and then when he noticed, because mm -hmm. it had been with him at some point, and mm. when he noticed the presence of God near David, mm. that's when it started. Mm. That's when the problem started. And it just shows how God's presence is such an important thing to have in your life. Because mm. as soon as it departs from you, mm. things go wrong. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a common thing I saw in the whole story. And I feel like that really spoke mm. to me. Yeah. yeah. There's a text that says that um, there's no rest for the wicked. You know, some of them even flee even when no one is pursuing them. So uh, I think the biggest encouragement there is that um, when you embody the spirit of Christ, when you embody the spirit of Christ, there's peace with that. Even, even when you're in the midst of, of challenges, there's a lot of peace that comes with, with embodying the, the spirit um, of the Lord. Um, thank you very much for, for that um, contribution. Now, um, Steve, I think... Um, this week we've, we've studied about um, souls consuming jealousy. In yes. fact, the author of this story was saying that it was unquenchable. You know, it was a jealousy and a hatred that could not be quenched. In other words, there was no remedy for, the, um, for this type of jealousy. And um, D David's success seemed to be in the middle of, of this conflict. And uh, his popularity in his kingdom, my goodness, um, uh, made Saul to run mad, uh, technically. And um, have you ever been jealous of a family member or a friend um, just because they've succeeded in one thing or the other, or you felt maybe, as Brenda has told us, you felt that maybe probably that should have been your place? Has this really ever happened to you in terms of now success? Uh, forget about that one for kids uh, yeah. loving toys and stuff like that. But now as a grown-up, pr pretty much a teen, yeah. um, have you ever felt jealous for maybe someone in school, a family member, a cousin who maybe got a pass with your dad and stuff like that? Is it a reality in your life? Uh, yes, I'll say yes. Because I remember back when I was in like in high school and all that. Uh, 
there was someone who was good in the spot I was playing in. That's football. And it got, he was so good to the point where I was like, why do you have to be that good? Mm. <laughs> like, it was so annoying. Mm. <laughs> and like, uh, it, it got me to the point where I was like, uh, I don't want that person to be there because it, it would ruin how I would perform. Because mm. I was trying to perform better than him, but in the end it turned out to be, mm. uh, yeah, to backfire me. Yeah, true. Okay, okay, that's that's amazing. I mean, did you tell them, or did you tell God? So did you tell God, hey, God, me, I'm jealous of this person. I mean, help me either acquire those talents or help me uh, deal with my inefficiencies. How did you deal with it? Thing, he never tells a person. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, okay. it's almost like uh, he never tells a person. Mm. Otherwise, the the they turn, they, do, they do that against you. Mm. People mm. tend to do so. Mm. And one thing I didn't do, though, was ask God about it. Mm. That's the one mistake I made. Mm. But I did come to realize that what I was doing was in vain mm. because it's not like I was going to gain those talents from him overnight and mm. be good, mm. you see? Yeah. Mm. And he taught me that I had to be good in my own right mm. in order to like earn mm. the success and mm. the, the joy that comes with it, the joy mm. of being good, yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Now, you guys, as we conclude, do you guys have friends? I mean, I'm just asking because um, in this story, I am seeing a friendship that even overlooked a parent's opinion of someone. You understand? Uh, we live in a society whereby um, sometimes if maybe probably a parent tells you hate someone, you know, you follow through and you hate. But we see here, Jonathan goes beyond that and, and declares his love for David and overlooks um, the opinion of, of Saul um, and, uh, we, and gets really sufficient soul ties that we can say probably even saved um, David's life. You guys, what do you think about that? Do you guys have such friends? Have you ever witnessed such friendships? What do you think, um, Gideon, maybe? Um, yeah, definitely. We have friends mm -hmm. that we just click with mm -hmm. and it's also sometimes questionable mm -hmm. how you guys are friends <laughs> and it might look weird to some other people. Yeah. But when you and the other person, mm -hmm. you know the essence of your friendship, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what people think about it, what opinions, mm -hmm. what conditions you're lying under because David and Jonathan, mm -hmm. Your father hates your friend. Mm. That could destroy everything you have you mm. have with your father. It mm. could destroy your relationship with your father. Mm. But on what basis is my mm. father having a certain beef mm. with my friend? Mm. You see that uh, it was jealousy. It mm. was just mere jealousy. Mm. But that that should not be enough to destroy the bond I've been creating with my friend. Mm. So it's definitely something we need to pay attention to that we should be vigilant on our friends. And when we say that this friendship is actually beneficial to us, mm. this friendship is actually bearing fruit, mm. um, what other people think about it doesn't, mm. doesn't matter. Mm. As long as it's not destroying some, somebody else's business mm. or something. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Good to go. Amazing, amazing. You see, again, you see, we might not, we might not be called to risk our lives for our friends. That's, that's for sure. But I think what uh, David and Jonathan had was, was really beautiful, you know. And, and is, it, is it possible to develop such godly friendships? Yani such friendships, mpaka until when you... When your dad tells you, but I mean, I hate this guy, you still go ahead with the friendship because you know it's genuine. Is it possible? Um, I think it's possible, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of courage because, mm -hmm. first of all, I'm, I'm just going to say from my point of view as being in an African household, mm -hmm. what your parents say is very important. Like, mm -hmm. if they say this, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you think about it, the part for gen it being genuine, in our generation, it's very hard to find genuine people. Mm. But it's also very hard to find people who aren't straightforward. My, mm. my generation is very straightforward. It will tell you mm. bluntly what is happening. Mm. And I feel like as long as people are honest with each other, they'll be able to find those genuine 
mm. relationships because you can't look for honesty in someone else. You have to start by looking for honesty in yourself. Mm. If you are an honest person, mm. like attract likes, and you will mm. find someone just like that, and that's where it will start. Mm. And at the end of the day, depend even though your parent is against it, if you know it's a good friendship, mm. you are the one who's going to use those connections in the future. And I don't want to use friendship as a connection thing, mm. but for David, because of uh, Jonathan's love for him. Later mm. on, David help, help, ends up helping his son mm. after Jonathan is long dead. Mm. And he helps his son and treats him like his own. Mm. And that's because of the love that they formed and the friendship they had when they were younger. Mm. So I feel like it is possible to find those friendships. Mm. And yes, our parents' opinion is important in who we are friends with. Mm. But at, at the end of the day, they're going to affect us and mm. our f lives in the future. Mm. Yeah. Steve, as we conclude, what's your parting shot? Uh, so, for the question you've just asked, I believe it is, it is possible because the Bible represents various themes that are applicable in real life situations. Mm. So I believe it, it was possible then, mm. it's possible now. Mm. But what I will add is that it requires a insane level of trust. Mm. Something which, uh, quoting Brenda, is not really visible in this generation, it's not really seen as much. So it requires a level of trust, it requires a level of dedication, and it requires also that we are able to put ourselves out there for mm. others. Mm. Mm. I think as we conclude, um, as you guys were speaking, one thing that came to my mind was that, you see, what Jonathan did um, for David is actually what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, he put his life on the line for, for our salvation. Um, and I think as we conclude, it's my prayer that we may, we may have um, such integrity and trust that people may trust us to, to do the right thing, even when um, everything seems to be um, against everything. So I'd like to ask Brenda to pray for us as we conclude. Okay, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you uh, this morning, we thank you for uh, the breath of life which you have gifted unto us. We don't take it for granted, Lord. We thank you for this lesson which we have learned um, uh, deeply about uh, the relationships that we can have with other people and how we can um, respond to certain negative emotions like envy. Help us to take example from Saul and to learn from his uh, mistakes and help us to be more like David, to be more like you so that we can um, show the world how amazing uh, being a follower of Christ is, Lord. May we be able to show the world what um, a human being, a kind person, an amazing uh, Christian should be. May we be an example to those around us. In just name we pray, amen. Amen.